They say seeing is believing, but believing that you have seen something can sometimes have dangerous consequences. Reality can be a strange thing. We take for granted what we see is real. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we are bombarded with stimuli affecting all our senses. The human brain can only process so much information at once. This information overload can often result in mistaken identity, and sometimes things are not as they seem. This is precisely what happened in Hammersmith in 1804 and where we will begin our story. Brew some coffee, pull up a chair, and open your mind. This week, Science vs. Conspiracy talk the murder of the ghost in Hammersmith, England. We'll be right back. Hello, this is the Pacific Wellbeing Mental Health Podcast. I'm Jennifer, and starting mid-August 2022, I'm going to be bringing you podcasts discussing mental health topics, trends, controversies, and news with an eye to informing and educating you on your path to well-being. I've been working in psychology and nursing for 20 years, and now I'm a doctoral student in counseling psychology. So I have a pretty keen insight into what makes us tick. Join me every second Wednesday, and we can explore the fascinating world of mental health together. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Hammersmith, located on the outskirts of London, England. It was situated as a border between the city and the rural area. Later in 1887, Hammersmith would become the location of the first suspension bridge built that would cross the River Thames. But back in December of 1803, the villagers of Hammersmith began being terrorized by a ghost covered in a white shroud. We have to remember that seeing someone covered in a white sheet was so uncommon that they were dressed as a ghost that the villagers were rightfully terrorized. It's said that the ghost would appear in the early hours of the morning after the one o'clock church bell would ring out. The apparition would often be seen in the fields adjacent to the Black Lion Lane. The theory at the time was that the ghost belonged to a villager who committed suicide by slitting his own throat the year before. On one notable occasion, the ghost appeared before a wagon with 16 travelers aboard and being pulled by eight horses. When the ghost appeared, the driver of the wagon became so frightened that he ran off, leaving the passengers at the scene. Another time, an unnamed pregnant woman was out by the churchyard around 10 p.m. where she said she saw a tall white figure rising from behind one of the tombstones. She tried to run away, however, she was grabbed by the ghost, which caused her to faint. By the time she was found hours later and taken back to a neighbor's house, the ghost was nowhere to be seen. These attacks continued into January of 1804. Although the sightings and attacks continued, the villagers had become skeptical that the phantom was not a ghost. But in fact, one of the fellow villagers masquerading as the ghost, men gathered and began patrolling the village streets in search of whoever or whatever was behind the hauntings. Unmasking them would bring a sense of security back to Hammersmith. The idea that this could be someone from their own community shocked the villagers. One of the men claimed to have witnessed the ghost removing the white cloth while running away in a failed captured attempt. By this point, the residents were on edge and the watchmen patrolling the area were finding it difficult to cover all possible entrance and exits to the village. It was becoming increasingly challenging to capture this ghost. According to the Old Bailey, which is London's central criminal court from 1674 to 1913, on the night of Tuesday, January 3rd, one of the villager watchmen by the name of Francis Smith set out on patrol alone. 
He had been frustrated by the lack of progress in finding the ghost. When Smith approached the area of Black Lion Lane, he spotted a figure dressed all in white approaching him. Later in court, Smith would testify that he called out to the figure, but nobody responded. The ghostly figure continued towards him. Frightened for his safety, Smith fired his weapon. The bullet struck the ghost in the jaw on the lower left side. Believing he had struck and killed the ghost, he ran over to the body, only to find that it wasn't a ghost at all, but a man by the name of Thomas Millwood. Another watchman, John Locke, heard the gunshot and came to investigate. Upon reaching the crossroads of Black Lion Lane and Beaver Lane, he found Thomas's lifeless body in a pool of blood. The white garment that Smith had seen was actually a white apron worn by bricklayers of the time. The white apron was now stained red with Thomas's own blood. Thomas Millwood had been a bricklayer by trade and was well liked by his family and friends. He was a tall slender man who often wore new or newly laundered white aprons because of his job as a bricklayer. Because of his build, he had been mistaken for the ghost on more than one occasion. Scared for his safety, Thomas' wife requested that he change his clothes or wear an overcoat as to not to frighten fellow villagers. When he refused to do so on the night of Tuesday, January 3rd, 1804, Thomas Millwood's choice would cost him everything, setting in motion a chain of events that would be felt for almost 200 years. With Thomas laying dead on the corner of Black Lion Lane and Beaver Lane, Francis became even more distraught and was eventually sent home to calm down, while the other watchmen moved Thomas's lifeless body to the Black Lion pub across the street. The coroner later determined that the death was a rash act of willful murder. Days went by, and on January 11, 1804, Francis Smith would stand trial for the murder of Thomas Millwood. Smith openly admitted of killing Thomas. However, he insisted that it was a case of mistaken identity and pleaded not guilty. The trial judge stated, However disgusted the jury might feel in their own minds with the person guilty of a misdemeanor of terrifying the neighborhood, still, the prisoner had no right to construe such misdemeanor into a capital offense, or to conclude that a man dressed in white was a ghost. In this case, there was a deliberate carrying of a loaded gun, which the prisoner concluded he was entitled to fire, but which he really was not, and he did fire it, with the rashness which the law does not excuse. In all the circumstances of the case, no man is allowed to kill another rashly. After deliberation, the jury found Francis Smith guilty of manslaughter and not murder. This outraged the three judges that heard the case and stated that the law did not permit them to accept the verdict because there was no circumstances of the case that could reduce the crime from murder to manslaughter. The jury was sent back to reconsider their verdict and returned with either a murder verdict or total acquittal. The judge said Millwood was not even attempting to run away. Even if he had been the Hammersmith ghost, the crimes committed by the ghost amount to only a misdemeanor of nuisance that would not have attracted a capital punishment. After re-deliberating, the jury then returned a guilty verdict, and the judge immediately pronounced the defendant guilty and sentenced him to death. At the time, this meant he would be hanged, and his body and remains would be sent to a medical college for dissection. Fortunately for Smith, there was a lot of sympathy for him in the village, and three weeks later, the sentence was reduced to only one year in prison, but with hard labor. The verdict became the basis of a self-defense strategy that haunted the British courts until 1983, when the ruling was finally clarified. The case exposed the issue 
of there being a lack of available defense for someone who believes that their actions, even violent actions, is necessary and acts in good faith but is mistaken about the situation. With the trial wrapped up and justice being served, there was still the unresolved issue. Who was the ghost? If Thomas Smith wasn't the ghost, who or what was haunting Hammersmith? Well, it turns out that a local shoemaker by the name of John Graham stepped forward and confessed to being the ghost. In a true Scooby-Doo reveal, he admitted to being the ghost because he wanted to take revenge on his apprentices after they told scary ghost stories to his children. Graham's confession seemed to put to rest the Hammersmith ghost until 1824, when new reports of the ghost started to reappear. This time, however, the ghost was said to have supernatural powers like breathing fire. The sightings lasted into the 1830s when the appearance of a new specter by the name of spring Heeled Jack emerged and took over the public's consciousness. However, patrons of the Black Lion Pub, the location where Millwood's lifeless body was carried, insist that his spirit still roams the halls of the pub to this very day. So what do you guys think? Was the shoemaker really responsible or was there something else happening in Hammersmith back in 1804? Let us know in the comments. If you like this content, please follow us and turn on those notifications so you'll get notified every time we release some new content. We release a new podcast every Friday afternoon and a new video on YouTube every Monday. That's it for now. I'm Conspiracy, and remember, being paranoid is smart. We'll see you next time. This week's episode of Science vs. Conspiracy Over Coffee was produced by Lethologica. Writing and research was done by Bob Homer and Jennifer Timer.